Chris. Welcome to the Sisterhood. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. From Tennessee, right? I'm all the way across the country from you. So what's it like where you live? Today? Today it's rainy. Right. <laughs> but it's it's beautiful <laughs> landscape, right? No, no, it's absolutely gorgeous. It sort of looks like the English countryside with rolling hills that roll up to the foothills and then it goes from the foothills uh, to the Great Smoky Mountains. And we're right on the Tennessee River. So it's a very picturesque place. We've had a very warm, wet winter. It's very green. The trees are barren, but all the grass and, uh, and the ground foliage is still very green. Mm -hmm. How did you find that property initially? Well, um, are you speaking, which property are you speaking of? Well, okay, so Blackberry Farm. Tell us about Blackberry Farm. Well, Blackberry Farm, that was an adventure that started 44 years ago. And the way that that began was the first year that I was married. We loved to, I loved to cook and entertain. I loved it so much that um, I did it every single night. And my husband said, well, we might as well be in the end business. And I said, great, go find us one. <laughs> And, and that's, that's exactly what he did. So, and the way that we found that, I think so many things happen this way through relationships. He had um, worked on a political campaign for a friend and happened to see this friend and asked him if he knew of anything. And his friend told him about this property back in the mountains uh, called Buttery Farm. And it was about, it's about 50 minutes away from where we live, but I, I have never even heard of it. I'm sorry about the noise. Okay. So you never even heard of it, but then all of a sudden it's, it's on the market. It, it, it wasn't open to the public at that time. It, that was in 1976. And um, I don't think it had been open to the public for a long time. Blackberry Farm was built in 1940. And it was open by the Little Sears and it was off. And then there was one other family that, that owned it. So it had been open off and on. I don't know how that door is open. As a bed and breakfast? As a... Yes, it, it was. Okay. Hold on. Can you hold on one second? Sure. Pause it for a second. Okay. Yep. So Blackberry Farm was used as a place for people to come over the years. It was over the years. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So then and you it, bought it. And, 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 and it was also used as a family home. It was originally built by Dave and Florida Lassier as their, they were from Chicago as their family retreat. And I think it was during, I know it was during the war and I don't think it exactly turned out the way they wanted it to. Maybe perhaps they didn't get down as much and then they turned it into an inn. And they had a family member that ran it. And then the next owner, the Jarvis family, the same thing. They uh, had, had it as a family home. And that, then they also opened it partially as, a, as, a, as an inn. And it was just eight bedrooms. I mean, it was a small little place. So then what happened when you bought it? What did you do with it? Well, when we bought it. We were young and risky uh, dreamers. And... Um, Sandy and I and baby Sam, we lived in two of the eight bedrooms and we leased it out for uh, four years to two banks. And that's the way that we paid our bills. And one, a local bank used it for business entertainment and the bank in Nashville, which is, was four hours away, would use it as, um, it was really a um, employee perk. Employees could come and, you know, enjoy all the facilities for a nominal amount and then tax laws changed and after a while um, by that time we had developed a clientele and it was not open by single rooms uh, it was only open by by full use um, in other words you had to you know uh, rent the whole facility and then in 1990 
we expanded and that's the first time that we opened to uh, individuals. Mm -hmm. So during this time where, I mean, did you equip yourself to be able to host um, in this way or how did you learn to, you know, do all the cooking and all the hospitality end? Well, Blackberry Farms is a labor of love and anything that you do repetitively over and over again, it just becomes second nature. I mean, if you cook breakfast, lunch, and dinner six days a week, you just develop a routine and little did we know that this routine would you know end up changing our lives and my uh, ex-husband sandy he's in the he was he and he still is it's in the restaurant business so we were both in hospitality mm-hmm. very different he, his restaurant concept was um a chain and so he was very good in the business aspect of it and i was very good in the hospitality aspect and it was a sort of um, complimentary. Mm -hmm. So talk to us a little bit about um, this new book you've written and why you've decided to to tackle maybe this life journey, uh, the story of your life journey. Well, the, um, my life, um, it's kind of hard to jump directly into the book. Can you say that question again? Sure. Um, would you rather, here, let's pause for a second. So, and success We just both supported each other 100%, full trust. Um, And the businesses just grow. You know, you ask how we kind of knew what to do. When I got to Alabama, it was the first time I hadn't worked. And it was, we moved in from my husband's business. And, but my whole life has been about home. And we, our home there called Rose Bay, it really became a little mini flatberry. It was like my little Petri dish. And I did everything there. I gardened, I cooked, I entertained, and I took all of the ideas and everything that I learned back to Tennessee, 532 miles away. And I just became known for entertaining, hosting, cooking. And I don't think it's because I'm any better than anybody. I just happen to do it more. Perhaps you could say, I mean, it was just something that just brings my life to life to, you know, watch people, to serve others, to watch people enjoy the table and and the community of the table. So at the same time, I lived 532 miles away, but my head was always in the Blackberry too. So what was happening? Um, so you were living apart from Blackberry and I'm assuming someone was running it during that time. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. And then you moved back after going to Alabama, you moved back to the farm. Yes, we did move to the farm and there were, um, I had in the, I guess you would say in the nineties, I mean, there was sort of like a 15 year period where I had three very life-changing events in my life. The Petri dish, the home that we loved more than anything, that was my, my, our home for 12 years, uh, one Saturday night burned to the ground. Mm-hmm. And we were very prepared to rebuild it. We had talked about architects and um, we're going to rebuild. And one morning when I was standing on the porch drinking coffee, because we had a little building in the back where we got to live while we were going to rebuild it. Um, a voice said to me, don't rebuild, it's time to move. Hmm. I called Sandy and I said, it's time, it's time for us to move. And he said, well, where do you want to move? And I said, Atlanta. 
because two divisions of his company had already moved to Atlanta. And I just felt like that's probably where we would end up. So we moved to Atlanta. And Atlanta is much closer. It's about 180 miles from Blackberry. And after we moved to Atlanta, well, basically within two years of the fire, we were back at Blackberry Farm and Ruby Tuesday headquarters had relocated. And that was the vote of 18 senior management. We had nothing, I mean, our businesses were always very separate. But so it was sort of like a miracle because when Ruby Tuesday moved back to um, Maryville, Tennessee, that's the closest town to Blackberry. So, oh, you're a, kidding. No, we're only uh, 13 miles apart. And that's when we moved back to Blackberry. Mm -hmm. How how was it for you to navigate your home burning and losing all of your physical possessions? The fire was very, very devastating. And the, the one quote, the one thing that I always remember as we were standing there with our good friends, the cookers and the lushers, as our house burned to the ground and my son, David came home, Sam, David, Sam was in college, away at college. He stood there and David said, you know, mom, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. Mm -hmm. And it really is. I think that I didn't properly really grieve the burning of that house. It, um, in, in writing the book and really looking at my life underneath a microscope, I can see things now that I didn't see before. And um, because building had been such a part, and is always, will be a part of my life, building a new home wasn't overwhelming to me. Um, but that's, it's just a place that you can't ever exactly go back when you move away from, and I'm still very close to Alabama, hmm. 24 years later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, where, where your children grow up and you form bonding relationships, that, those are very, very special. Mm -hmm. Relationships are everything. Mm -hmm. I threw myself head first only into work. So is that what you mean when you say you didn't fully grieve? Is that you you became occupied with work? Exactly. So we were empty nesters at the time of the fire. Uh, we moved. Sandy moved his company. We threw ourselves 100, not just 100% into work, but 150. And that's our sort of default mode, mode. And that is just, that role is probably easier for us than going out and forming new relationships in a new community. And the next event that happened in my life was, um, Less than two years after we moved back, I fell in my driveway and I suffered a traumatic brain injury. And all of this, these occurrences, I got my physical health, health back. That took about a year. I wasn't allowed to work. And that was the first time when all you have in your life is work. And you don't, you're not supported by a community relationship. And I had a great community of work uh, related uh, friendships, but community of family, church, friends. I, um, I found out I really didn't have anything. Hmm. And there was a huge void in my life. 
And this was at the time we'd already done our succession plan and my son, Sam, was coming back into the business. He was in California going, going to culinary school. And it was very hard. I didn't have the community to talk to, to ask things about, to... So I just defaulted and went back to work still with this sort of aching boy, just in a different role. Hmm. So I'm assuming that that changed you a little bit and your perspective. So how did you, did you start to pivot at all and do things differently? I did. What happened was, um, deafness, because from my a- accident, I, I'm 70% deaf. And I was certain that if I regained my physical health, because I was partially paralyzed, walking with a cane, that came back pretty fast, um, you know, within a year. But I didn't realize the psychological changes that would happen with deafness. Um, It was hard to converse in crowds. Uh, It's practically impossible to go to a restaurant. I can't understand tones of children and women as well. I can understand deeper tones. You just miss a lot being deaf. You can't engage in a conversation. Uh, You often can't even watch movies because anytime somebody turns their back or there's a dark screen. And so you lose, and then you just get psychologically exhausted. But I didn't have a name or... I I just wanted to get back to exactly the way things were. Hmm. And deafness was a door that I walked through that things were never going to be the same. And I did not accept that. I did not accept my handicap. I did not deal with it. I just wanted it to seem like everything was the same. And that caused problems in, I think it caused problems in my family and in other relationships, and I just sort of retreated into myself. And then the, the result was I lost my self-confidence. I lost my self-confidence. And going from a woman that was totally self-confident to losing your self-confidence really affects every part of your life. Hmm. And that was a very um, dark season. And I think that that really lasted probably about eight years. So how did that impact your marriage during that time? Well, I think that um, there was never any direct discussion on it, which because conversational communication was not our love language, work was. And when I no longer wanted to work or I didn't have that passion, if that is your language of love and that is your only one, you, there was a big void in our relationship and it suffered. And it, it didn't make it through it. Um, I, the years following my accident were really just a downward spiral of loneliness and insecurities and sadness and not knowing who, who to turn to because my life on the outside is so successful. It looks so good. That is, you know, what I've known for, you know, making, making life beautiful. And so I just felt like an imposter in my own skin. And anytime you're not authentic, I mean, if you're broken, you're broken. You need to deal with that. Uh, there, there will be hard things in your life. You just have to look at it head on. And I did not. So, what happened? I mean, how did you get to the point where you said, okay, 
<clears throat> excuse me, where you said, all right, I'm ready to move forward. I'm ready to do something differently. And what did you do? Well, typical, typically, I told Sandy, I said, you know, Sam was running Blackberry. I said, I need a new life. I need a community. Can we move to Knoxville? So we moved back to Knoxville. And I ran from it for a long time because busy, busyness could be my patch and glue. If I was busy doing something, and I like, you know, you know, like cooking, lots of hands-on. I went to photography school for over 16 months. I formed a photography business, just busy things. But what I really was missing um, were relationships. And when our younger son, David, got married at Blackberry, um, and I was planning the wedding with his mother-in-law, I passed Doug Bannister, uh, a pastor who had come, up, come to the hospital and prayed over me uh, when I was in intensive care. And I had met him and we had gone to his church several times. And because Sandy and I were not, I called us priesters. We were Christians that went to church at Easter and Christmas. And right, <laughs> yeah. But I really liked Doug's church. And so I passed him and I said, Doug, well, this is a man I really hadn't talked to much in probably seven years. I said, Doug, would you do the family prayer dinner on Thursday night for us, for David? And Doug was, yes, I would be happy to do that. And we reconnected at that time. So that was in 2008. Then in 2010, when we moved into Knoxville, Doug invited me to go to come to his executive women's Bible study. Now, I had had two other friends that asked me to join a Bible study. And I had done it because I really wanted a community of women. And they were too large. One was you would go and have your sermon, which was really good in the chapel, and then you'd sit around in a group of 30 women. But I couldn't hear the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then the next one was sort of a classroom style. And I couldn't understand that either. And I had seen Doug. And he, anyway, so he asked me if I would do that. And I said, yes, how many people are in the group? And he said, well, to begin with, just two. And it was a friend. So see, once again, it was my comfort zone. And he just reached out and met me. And it was during those, we met every two weeks. And every two weeks, Doug would say, well, before we begin, how was your week? How was everything? Everything going okay? And do you know, Krista, that no person would ever ask me that? Wow. I mean, and I didn't even realize that. See, my whole life revolved around work and fixing things for other people and doing things. And that does give you great fulfillment. Mm -hmm. But guess what? You need to be taken care of too. And you need somebody to ask you and to reach out like that. And probably after a couple of months, I said, Doug, do you think that we could maybe have a meeting in your office once a month? Because I thought, I really, because I still wouldn't say anything. I'd still say my life is just great. Because if you look at my life on the outside, how could it be anything but perfect? Mm -hmm. um, success can put blinders on you. So um, I started talking to Doug. And Doug had been praying for me for 10 years that I would fall in love with Jesus. Wow. And he told me this later. He said, and I really vividly still don't understand this. He said, you were one of my Andrews. You, I said, what does that mean? He said, you were one of the people that I always prayed that 
you on the war. So during that time, starting in 2010 when we moved, I shared my physical and my emotional struggles with Doug. I had never told anybody. It was way too much uh, angst to hold within yourself. Um, and I was told him that things that were tormenting me and cause, causing me to ask some big questions. And Doug, I mean, he just opened my eyes to Jesus, but it was still really hard. I think that I came to the Lord first through what I say, Father God, and in the Old Testament. I could really, I had to find something I could relate to. I could relate to the struggles of Joseph and a lot of the Old Testament um, characters. And particularly to... Um, Moses. Yeah, wasn't it Moses with Aaron? Uh huh. And and having somebody speak for you. Right. So just brought out all of these things. And I would ask them, I said, Doug, I think I'm a Christian in kindergarten and I need lots of information. I need a lot of guidance in that big black book. And he would give me things to read that just opened my eyes. And one week, he, t he emailed me. He said, read this scripture. And when we meet next time, tell me what you think about it. And it was John 5, I think 1 through 9. And it was about the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. And I read it over and over and over again. And I said, that's me. That's me. Jesus is telling me to pick up my mat and I will be healed. I follow him. And when you talk about uh, a rebirth, I mean, in one second, things were so in focus, mm. so clear. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen just like that because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a, it's a forever process. And it started with so many things. Um, but that was the big thing. Isn't that, that so beautiful how a scripture, I mean, because it's so living and active and it just like went straight into your deepest place yes. and it just moved you and really dislodged you from where you were exactly and it was just and it was because he taught me so much it's so reaching out to somebody just you know the, the very patience about teaching a, a woman that's 60 years old that this is how you pray give yourself time all the things that I, we that I just take for granted and do now every day by yourself, talk to God, give yourself time on your schedule with God and start with, you know, 10 minutes if that's all you can do start. And then it got to be in my um, living room every morning over coffee, 20 minutes wasn't enough. An hour wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. and Sandy would come down and he'd say, so what did you learn today? And he was so interested. And um, I really thought that that season that we were coming through it together. And that's not what ended up happening. But the um, miraculous things that God does because we don't know where what our, our, I guess, uh, what our, his purpose for us is. But my time of coming to Jesus and ca came before the problems in my marriage. Mm. And that is such a miracle. I don't know what I would have done. 
Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I, I echo what Krista said about one story for you to be able to see yourself in it. And it's such an encouragement for us to remember that God's word is stories about real people that are intentionally put in there by him, knowing that they are going to impact us because we can see ourselves in them person to person. The humanity that is expressed in the Bible is real. And I think you're a great example of how the Bible still speaks to us today in very hard, painful places. It does. And it also, I mean, it speaks so much in love. There is, it's just, God's word is amazing that it's, so timeless forever mm -hmm. and also the stories in different seasons in your life the same stories can mean different things you can see different messages that god is telling you through the same story that you've read right it hits you differently in different times yeah. so you said there were three things that happened within a few years yes and then, of course, the next was um, when my husband said he didn't want to be married anymore. And that was, that was devastating. Uh, it was, um, and God still works in mysterious ways. We had a lot of problems. And w one word that he said, he said, this could be the best thing for us or the worst thing for us. And of course, being a believer, I thought, oh, if we can come to the Lord together at this time, nothing will be better. Nothing. Because I still firmly believe in marriage and working through all problems. Um, and, but that's not what always is God's plan, I suppose. So as you were moving through this process, did you just surrender to this journey that, that he was pushing you toward of divorce or how did, how did you navigate that road? Cause you had conflicting ideas, right? You're thinking, well, God can save this marriage. We can, you know, continue in a different way. So how did you find a peace in that? Well, it, that, it was a long process. We had wonderful Christian counselors that we went to, uh, and it's a, a weekly, it was a week long program. And I thought everything was going, you know, really well. And at the end of those five days, he, um, I guess I could tell in my heart that he really, my ex-husband didn't, did not want to do everything that it took to put our relationship back together. And we still stayed together for, an, uh, for another month and going to celebrate. Um, uh, it was 4th of July, on the market, cooking with friends, everything planned. And I was sitting there, we were watching a movie. And I just turned to him. I don't know, sometimes I can just feel things inside. And I said, Sandy, you don't want to be married anymore, do you? He said, no. And I simply, that's, we were in Alabama in our cottage there. We had another little cottage. And I went to bed and I just got up and I drove home the next morning. I didn't know what to do. And of course, the first person I called was Doug. And I said, can you meet me at my house? And he said, yes. And we had my friend Bernadette there, an old friend. Bernadette and her husband, they had um, managed Blackberry Farm for 13 years. And we were just really good friends. See, once again, as I said, I had really working friends. So mm -hmm. she was a good friend. That, and they had a, they have a beautiful business of their own. But so I called her and I was just devastated. And Doug pastored me through all the, uh, 
some of the problems in our marriage, I mean, they're as hard as the trail's hard. The trail's very hard. Mm-hmm. The trail after 36 years is very, very hard. And um, so it was, I am blessed that God saw me through it. And I mean, I can jump many years later on, you know, what happened after that. But it was, I will just ask questions. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I ramble. Well, so, so just tell us, I mean, I, I feel like when, when a person is in a season of pain, of even trauma, um, I mean, I think about that was the life you knew that was 36 years and you'd spend it with the same person. And so, I mean, that just rips you to shreds. I mean, it just, you know, just lays your heart bare, just wide open. And so how, even during that time, how did you continue to just put one foot in front of the other in the midst of like, my life is forever changed now, according to what I've always known. I mean, how, how did you do that in that time? Well, prayer in the morning, that was so very important. And by that time, I did have uh, Christian friends. And my Christian community, that was everything. And in my family, because we and all of our family, the Bell family is very large. Sandy has, is one of five. And we, for a couple, well, probably about a year. We just kept going on because Sandy and I, um, we didn't ever fight in our marriage. I mean, I had 36 good years and I thought that perhaps that he would come around. I would see him for lunch. I'd see him at uh, grandparents' days and all of those things. And then two years later, we were at a grandparents event and they're three hours and we have five, three hours each. They've come back to two hours each. We have a lot of grandchildren. So <laughs> they, and Sandy moved out of town and went into a consulting business, et cetera. So I didn't see him around all the time. But once again, that voice on the second day, like hour six, we were going to go out to lunch the next week. A little voice inside of me said, it's time to heal. Step back. You don't need to be around it. And I did that. And see, I was retired and I was lost. And I was just being busy and cooking and doing a lot of things with my grandchildren, which was fun. But that's just a little patch. And I really started to... Um, reach out, and I'll tell you the big thing that happened. Once again, back to work, my son Sam, who was running Blackberry at the time, he asked me to come back as director of design. And I moved back to Blackberry. And I think that Sam knew that just being surrounded by young, positive energy all the time and doing what I knew how to do. And I did, I started to heal in that. And I even went out on a date for the first time. And by that time, it was about 40 years, not quite. Wow. Yeah. yeah that, right. That was very scary. Oh, my and gosh. I, and when I was asked out, I, I mean, I was so afraid to go out that I thought, I said that we could have dinner at Blackberry because I felt like I'd be surrounded by my family <laughs> and I'd be in a safe zone. I mean, it was so frightening. Uh, and little by little, just, I, I just came back. And the biggest thing that happened was, I mean, it's, it's just amazing what God does because I had, during that time, I had moved out of the house that we lived in. Somebody just knocked on my door. I was, I mean, I was working in, in, in the museum. I never put my house on the market, which is very traumatic. So, and they asked if they could buy it. So I sold that and moved back up to Blackberry. 
and I moved into this little 324 square foot shed, um, one room, because I had ended up and I sold my house furnished. I thought, I'm just having a brand new start. And those five months in that shed were just such a great time of shedding everything. And you talk about meeting the Lord in there. It was, it was wonderful. It was in my, um, during that time, um, I was asked to speak at, in Nashville at the Antique and Garden Show. And I said, I called up the co the co-chairman when they put me in contact. And I said, are you sure you want me to speak? I'm not a speaker. And they said, yes. And so I said, well, what do you want me to talk about? And the answer was, well, whatever you want. And that's sort of like getting the designer and telling them to do whatever they want to your house. That can be scary. Um, yes. I'm like, don't you want to give me a little direction? No, whatever you want. And you can invite your friend Suzanne Castor, because I know you all do a lot of things. I said, she's the one that should have the program. She's written two books. I said, no, I want you to. And that's right when I moved into the shed. And I was remodeling the little historic farmhouse across from it. And that's where I was going to move and was very happy because it's like a little farmstead. And um, so I thought, that's no big deal. I'll just give my Blackberry Farm story. That's all I've ever done. That's all I know. So I'll do that. And that was in May. And the talk was not until January because they have to do it so in advance to do the publicity. Mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and they said, oh, by the way, the keynote speaker is Diane Keaton. I said, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said, how many people, how many people are we going to be speaking to? And they said, well, however many tickets sell. And I said, well, how many are there? And they said, 709. I'm like, really? So I wrote my speech finally. I wanted to finish it by Thanksgiving. It was so boring. It sounded like a fifty year, uh, a forty year punch list. Yeah, yeah. So I had my monthly meeting with Doug, and I said, "Doug, you do this every single week. Why don't you give me some tips on what to do?" Typical Doug, during those hour meetings, he usually says three things, and I talk the rest of the time. He said, "Well, I want you to watch uh, Steve Jobs' commencement speech." Okay. I said, "Where?" He said, "YouTube." And I watched it, and Steve Jobs didn't talk about Apple. He talked about connecting the dots. I went back to the shed, and I started connecting the dots of my life. It was the first time I was looking backwards instead of forwards. Instead of dreaming and building and doing and being busy, I sat still. And for the first time in my life, I could really hear, I could hear that, I don't know, it, I, I, in that tiny little place, my world expanded. And I began to hear, to really hear the voice inside of me and what he was saying, not just those little snippets about it's time to move or something like that. Um, and from the shed emerged the Nashville talk. And for 18 minutes, I did something that I'd never done before. I told all my truths. Hmm. I gave an honest recounting of my life so far. And at the very, at the end, every person in the room were on their feet, clapping, some were laughing, mm -hmm. some were crying. And it was, I guess, the first time in that speech, even in the process that I had been authentic to myself, that I had accepted my failures. I had asked for forgiveness, true forgiveness, not for others, but of myself. How my not being able to accept and deal with my handicaps, that it ruined the few relationships that I did have. There, mm -hmm. I mean, with Sandy, with my children, 
Um, and I still had all the working relationships that really, you know, stayed the same. So, um, that's really interesting. That, oh, go ahead. No, just looking back and being totally honest with yourself. So that's actually my question for you is, do you feel like that's a part of healing is actually telling yourself the truth? Oh, absolutely. And, and speaking your truths. Now, you know what? I look at this speech now. I honestly cannot believe, you know, innocence can be really good. I can't believe I gave that speech on that, on that stage for 18 minutes. But I did, and I literally turned myself upside down and just let God refill me. And I'm at an antique and garden show. <laughs> That's what kills me. And <laughs> I, you know, but see, the, the name of my talk, this is my whole life, and this is what I'm known for, the power and passion of home. Mm -hmm. And at the end, I said, for me, God is here. Mm. And this didn't even come until I wrote it. And when I was writing this speech, I was working on it. And one of the biggest, um, one of the books I was reading at that time was Sue Monk's Kid, When the Heart Waits. And this is, was sort of about her middle passage and I was pretty late for going through my mental passage. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there's a point when you have to grow up and you can either really make a decision and as a Christian through God to, to grow up and to accept. Uh, and I don't even think that I had grown up you know, in a relationship, it's emotional and it's spiritual and it's physical and it's psychological. And a lot of times, if you put too much emphasis on something, Sandy and I had a very good intellectual relationship and that was business, but we didn't develop the other sides of it. And I do think that when I got a divorce, I probably had the emotional maturity of a, somebody much younger. <laughs> and it was really just looking at all of those things and studying and, and asking my pastor and my Christian psychologist. And it's, it's just been a wonderful growth. And it's never too late. It's mm -hmm. never too late to grow. Um, I... Uh, at one point in writing my book, when you do a proposal, I had a friend, they said, maybe you should do two books. Maybe you should do The Shed and write down just 10 things that you learned in The Shed because that was such a growth period in that tiny place. When you don't have anything else to do, when you don't have laundry or you can't entertain or you can't, you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. But just go inside and listen to God. And it was, it was pretty incredible. Hmm. Well, I would love to read that. So you tell me when you have that one out too. <laughs> well, it's, well, it's odd. I started writing, but it's just, that's, it's just a little tiny guidebook yeah. because while I'm promoting my book, I thought, what do I want to talk about when I go to the bookstore? Um, the launch speech last night was more of a trailer of the whole book, but you know, the shake just beach. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the things that I learned, I'll tell you what I learned. If you're interested, I learned everything that you need in life is in your heart. And I went through the process of turning myself upside down and emptying out and letting God refill me. And that's like I was saying, you're never too old to learn. We can continue to grow and change because we can always count on change. Yeah. Um, I said, forgiveness is a choice 
and one that we have to make over and over and over again. Earth is a forgiveness school. Mm. Sandy and Sandy and I, we have journeyed to a place over our um, divorce that we can now both say that we're sorry. And we will forever be connected in our business and in our family. And I now call him my best ex. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. That's amazing, Chris. I I, I I say, hey, best ex, what city are you in today? (laughs) Um, Wow, that's gracious. in, in, In the shed. People, and I am, I can tell you one thing I'm really blessed about, that I don't harbor and carry things. And so many people have asked me about that. I said, oh, no, I think it's a God-given gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's probably a root of that honesty, too, because you've worked through some things and you have faced them so that you can then turn and face him with more grace because you face them before God on your own. And you know what? I think I had to learn that lesson the hard way because I say I don't harbor any, but I did for those 10 years. I was upset that I couldn't operate the same, same way that I used to. Absolutely. And every time you hold something in like that, it manifests itself in horrible ways. And, um, and it was, it was taking responsibility for my failure to accept it and deal with it, even though I didn't know how to, but uh, even if you don't know how to do something, just find somebody to help you. And I think that that's one of the things, like I said, success can put a blinder on things in life. Sometimes your success will gloss over things because I wasn't ever a person that somebody would say, hey, is everything okay? Is everything all right? And until Doug asked me that, um, I just just kept repeating exactly what I always did, I guess, to get the um, fulfillment out of the little things that I could do. Hmm. Uh, And you know what I learned from um, my failure to um, accept myself for who I am now? is that you can learn more from failures than you can from success if you look at them and deal with them. Mm. And of course, the biggest thing is that relationships are the most important in life. Mm. People and God, that's the most important thing. Yeah, beautiful. I was looking at the questions that I sent, that answers that I sent you. I, I put in there relationships for second. I thought, I was looking over that today. I was like, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, you said, uh, yeah, what are some tips that you have for making life well in this season of your life? And I put relationships are my second priority. <laughs> um, I think another big lesson, and I'm sure you all have talked about this, joy versus happiness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the difference in that. Once you find God, you have joy no, no matter what happens. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we had, who was that that talked all about, what, who, why am I blanking? She's in Nebraska. I won't cut this out. Never mind. <laughs> okay. Oh my know. gosh. Oh, Jennifer Dukes Lee. Oh yeah. Jennifer Dukes Lee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She talks all about joy versus happiness. Um, I wanted to read this to you, Chris, because I, fe- I read this yesterday in my devotional. You were speaking of Jesus calling um, when we were talking at the beginning, and this is actually one of it's Jesus today, but it says, um, because of the nature of time, there's only one direction to travel, and that is forward. Your life on earth is a journey beginning at birth and ending at the gates of heaven. I am your guide, and your responsibility is to follow me wherever I lead. I'm also your shepherd, and I always lead you along the best possible path, no matter how painful or confusing it may be. When your path takes you through a dark valley and you are struggling, look to me for help. Follow me obediently, trusting me in the midst of darkness and confusion. And little by little, I turn your darkness into light. 
And I just feel like that so describes everything you've been talking about. It's, it certainly does. And you know what? It's, it's a step on God's ladder and God's tongue is different than our tongue. Um, it's, I hope that, I know that God has put me here, that my purpose is to help other women my age, that um, in the second act, and it's, uh, you know, just like I said, it's never too late to learn. Mm -hmm. And my other purpose is to give back. I've been given so much in life. My purpose in life is to give back. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing your story. And I just think as, as we look at this topic of resilience, I feel like you, you gave so many helpful comments that I think will really help listeners. So thank you for that. Okay. Before we let you go, we do need to ask you about some of these things that are just unique to you and special to you because you are a person who does life in an interesting way. So tell us what are some of those things that you were referring to when you looked at um, the answers you wrote earlier that, that make your life work well? The things, you mean the questions that you were asking me before? Yeah. So oh, um, you said little... like you your, said, nin okay. your, nin your ninja blender, we just like to end yeah, on a fun yeah, note. You, so. you said that you can't live without well it's ninja blender in the morning okay. and it's that's that is my breakfast protein drink and what do you put in I, it well i put strawberries and bananas and then this protein powder uh powder that uh actually it helps my interior it's just something my wellness doctor gave me i don't know your interior it. situation <laughs> my interior situation is called it's not very pretty it's called leaky gut Okay, um, yeah. It doesn't absorb nutrients exactly the way that it's supposed to. I feel great. I don't feel like I have a leaky gut, but do you know the name of the protein powder? No, but I can I can get it. It's right now. Oh, okay. Yeah, you have to you have to send it to us. Oh, she's getting it actually. <laughs> hey, Krista. I was supposed to meet Molly at, right now. Okay. So I texted her that I would be fifteen. Yeah, it's called Ultra GI Replenish. Yeah, replenish. Not, not, this is vanilla flavor. Okay, Ultra GI Replenish. I love By Metagenics. It. And hear all the things that. Okay. So, ninja. Okay, mm -hmm. so you you what else? What else can you not live without? I cannot live without roses. I'm sitting here looking at the roses right on my coffee table. Roses. Do you have a special kind? Because there's so many kinds. Sometimes I'm like, what kind should I buy? Well, well. <laughs> Go to Fresh Market or wherever your grocery store is and buy whatever whatever you like, whatever it looks like. Mine are usually orange. They're orange and uh, variation colors because this this house is all in warm tones. Now, if it's, it just all depends. If I, if I live in somewhere else, then I get different tones. But as far as growing, because I love to grow roses, I love to grow antique roses. Mm -hmm. And those primarily only bloom once a year and they're spectacular but most of the ones in my house that I just get locally are just copper teas mm -hmm. okay but in the winter Linton roses which is not exactly a rose and it, it's a, a perennial that comes up every winter love those okay talk to me about crisp sheets because that's something you really love right well I think I got spoiled a long time ago when we started pressing our sheets at blackberry so i still enjoy that yeah that I is don't nice do, i don't <laughs> I I would would like that. really nice it's pretty <laughs> indulgent i don't do it everywhere but just you know, I love yeah okay and what about a favorite tradition do you have a favorite tradition well, my favorite tradition, you know, I was talking about Alabama, is going to uh, Point Clear, Alabama, where I lived for 12 years, where the house was that we burned down, and just going there and just seeing the sights, going through memory lane, being with my dear friends, cooking all the fresh seafood, 
the live um, the live oak trees with the Spanish moss, uh, bicycling, walking everywhere, and it's on Mobile Bay, so it's on a water, but it's not the ocean. It's there's just a lot of sunsets and sunrises. So that's probably my favorite tradition. I go there every June with the same friends. So fun. I've never even heard of that place. So that's really fun. Well, it's sort of, did you see the movie Forrest Gump? Uh Uh-huh. The writers from there. Okay. Like that. Okay. Oh, that's fun. Claim to fame. Okay. What about favorite recipe? Favorite recipe, chicken marbella. Mm -hmm. It is a silver palate chicken recipe that is loved by all ages. You can do ahead. You can eat at room temperature or warm. And for me, favorite recipes now for entertaining are always do ahead. Yes. And do you know, I freeze chicken marbella all the time and just always have one in the freezer I can pull out. Okay. All of you freeze it already cooked? No, no, but I make it and then I just, yep. And then I just freeze it in big pans. I just did that and I had too many pieces. So I put them in a baggie and I thought, I'll just pull this out. Just me single I never did. I left it in there. Too. So it does, you don't cook it, right? And then right. you pull it and you finish it. Okay, good. I'll right. do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Okay. Any other recipes you love? Pardon me? Any other recipes that you just have to mention? Well, I have a skillet bread, but I don't think you can go to the internet to get it. Okay. I did. And then I made a variation. It is a non-kneaded bread that you it's just three cups of flours and it's probably one cup of yeast however much uh water it takes salt pepper and then i add cheese onions chopped onions raw onions and then you can put herbs in it and even big fresh black pepper and i put it in an iron skillet and roast it and it of course, it smells so good. It, everybody thinks you've worked making bread all day, and it's literally just taking two rises for it. So that that's sounds awesome. amazing. I've never even heard of yeah. doing that. So skillet bread. Okay, I love it. Where do you live right now, Chris? This very second, I live, and actually, I've lived here uh, off and on for four years since I retired uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. Okay. On, on the Tennessee River, I live in a 1917 carriage house that's been redone. And uh, on a clear day, I can see the mountains. Today, it's not clear. So fun. Beautiful rain. <laughs> well, thank you, Chris, so much for being on today and for sharing your story. And um, I know you're on Instagram. And of course, Blackberry Farm is on Instagram as well. It's kind of an Instagram sensation over there. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really proud of the Blackberry team. It's, it's wonderful to uh, plant a seed for a business and for your son to take it to great new heights. Mm-hmm. And my daughter-in-law is just the most amazing woman. She's just doing a great job um, at Blackberry so fun. Well, we'll have to have them on sometime too. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. We wish you the best. Okay. Thank you. Bye. God bless you. Bye. God bless you. Okay. See you later, Chris. Bye.